I'm Michael Beck, the host of the Mike the Mike podcast. If you've been following along with me, it's great to have you back here again. And if you're listening in for the first time, welcome. This is a place to talk about the arts as well as personal well-being. Sometimes I'll talk more about art, while other times I'll talk more about mental and physical health. But regardless of the topic, I hope to encourage greater openness and understanding as I seek to better understand myself and the things and people around me. That was a clip of the instrumental titled Save Theme from my Lancaster project from the EP Fun. And uh, welcome to episode 25, a uh, good number 25. You could say that we're now a quarter of a way into the podcast, uh, but that sounds kind of strange. Uh, however, not as strange as when uh, you turn 25 and someone says you're a quarter of a century old. It's like, wow, what a way to make feeling young sound ancient. But uh, hey, we're all getting older. I tried processing through that, uh, some in my 11th episode uh, titled, What's My Age Again? Bonus points to you if you can get the Blink-182 reference. Now, if you haven't listened to episode 24, uh, my conversation with Wyatt Baldwin, I would encourage you to do so. You could say this episode contains spoilers, but I would say at least things will be It'll make more sense if you do uh, go and listen to that before continuing on with this conversation. We'll have to see if uh, this becomes an ongoing thing or not, but I wanted to at least follow up on my last episode by giving uh, my reflections, and uh, I wanted to share some of the things that uh, stood out to me, some takeaways, I guess you could say. I believe this may serve as a good uh, segue uh, going from talking with a guest back to a soul discussion. So as uh, for my conversation with Wyatt, I would say first and foremost, I was encouraged and inspired to hear from someone else's story and and just affirm uh, that we're all on this journey, learning and growing. And it can take something like six years to get to where you are now, but all those years in between aren't wasted. They're invaluable and they build on each other. And it's from there that you get to where you are now. Hopefully the failures and the missteps uh, didn't keep you down, but you learned what didn't work. And after so many attempts, you find some things that work. I really like the way that Wyatt said, I think a lot of people want to get good at it and then do the thing, but you have to do the thing to get good at it, end quote. So all those years may just be doing the thing to be good at it, but you also don't always know where your life is heading and where you know, it might end up and how all those steps along the way might lead you and guide you to something new and unexpected. And along that train, I thought it was really cool how the conversation ended. I like to ask guests on the podcast this question, what is your personal criteria for success or something to that effect? That's just the best way I can think to phrase the question at the moment. So I asked why that question and to paraphrase his response, uh, this is just uh, a bit of what he replied. I felt really good about setting little goals for myself and getting to them. I think finding your definition of good and flying as close to that as you can, as often as you can, is success for me. Just take those baby steps every day. Everyone says don't be a baby, but I say be a baby. Take those little steps, have those little pleasures, and just feel good about it." End quote. I found why it's a level of honesty really refreshing, and I feel like there's a boldness to it very unashamed and confident to tell it like it is and and own it. I think that's really healthy for us as people to get really get real about uh about things that motivate us and the things we desire. Let me share this quote from why and explain what I mean before I continue with my thoughts. Why wouldn't you want your stuff to go platinum, even if it is a little folk song you did in your bedroom? I don't want us to act like we don't want as many people as we can to hear it and relate to it. And some people will not like it. I'm not trying to write stuff that everyone will like and no one will have a problem with. I just want anyone who will like it to hear it." End quote. White also talked about performing uh, for the first time, uh, hearing the applause and enjoying the attention. And I guess I don't hear that talked uh, about much from people I know. 
I feel like there's a lot of false modesty out there, folks, you know, like trying to outdo one another for the modesty award. I guess it kind of depends on the circle you find yourself in, but I feel like these things tend to permeate and bleed over into every area of our lives. Um, what I'm getting at is the paradox uh, that our Western society tells us to, to value people for their personal achievement. Uh, so that means striving for position of status and wealth. And yet at the same time, we're supposed to act like you don't want it because to act like you want it would mean that you're self-centered and egotistical. On some level, in some way, we all want to do well and we want to find attention. Those aren't inherently bad desires. As with all things, it's what we do with our thoughts and desires that counts most. There is a way to go about seeking success and attention without stepping over everyone else to obtain it. But what a concept that is, right? But hopefully when we're all at our best, it elevates everyone else. Everyone benefits. And as far as getting attention goes, I mean, aren't we worth it? Don't we all deserve to find our own ways of getting that feedback and validation? Take it from Morrissey of the Smiths. I'm human and I need to be loved just like everybody else does. So I don't mean to misinterpret Wyatt's words and his intent. He's certainly not someone who is desperate for attention. I'm just trying to say that I found it very refreshing that he's able to be honest about what he wants. I feel I've been around too many people who act like they're saints, act all modest, but they're so caught up in their own lane that they'll walk right past you and make you feel like you're not worth their time because they're not really on their level as far along as them. As, as if to say, sure, you can tag along with me as long as you can keep up. So that's been my experience with a number of people, but that has certainly not been the case with Wyatt or Nadia, the co-host of the Peanut Butter and Jam's open mic. I really love what both of them are doing with it, um, the space they're creating and how they're raising up new and old performers alike. I love that there is a place in Williamsburg where people can perform for the very first time next to those who have been performing for years. And that was like me about a month ago as of this recording. I performed my own songs for the first time in front of a live audience which is very different even when compared with performing uh, someone else's songs, uh, at least in the general sense, I feel like it it feels uh, much more intimidating and vulnerable performing your own songs. I've played in church bands before, but I was playing in bands, uh, but it's different uh, to you know take the stage by yourself and perform something you know so personal and uniquely your own. So in case I haven't already said it, thanks so much to Wyatt for inviting me out to his open mic and for giving me that opportunity. And I've been really struck by how encouraging so many of the other performers who have come out have been. And just this past time I went, there was a guy present who was there uh, the very first time I performed and he was sharing that he really appreciated my performance and that he was seeing my improvement since the first time. And, you know, I've had at least uh, one other person say something similar and it just feels really special. It means a lot to me. And I know that they're giving that same encouragement to others as well. And it's just like, wow, these people actually want to see you succeeding and being at your best. And, you know, when they're when they see it, uh, they're not afraid to let you know. And as I mentioned during my conversation with Wyatt, uh, my motivation for going to the open mic was uh, to meet new people. And that's what I've been doing. It's been really great connecting with other creative folks. And uh, most of them uh, happen to be around my same age. And I met one guy who uh, does photography as well. And a few weekends back, we went out and uh, took pictures together, and I had a blast. It was the first time, actually, that I've gotten out and taken pictures with a fellow photographer. And, you know, I often go out by myself to take photos, but when I do uh, take photos with another person with me, I'm uh, the only one taking photos. Uh, so it was a really great opportunity uh, that I wouldn't have had otherwise. And I would, I, you know, I so wish that I could have discovered this open mic and this tribe of people, which gather around live performances a long time ago, but you know I have it now, and although the culture may differ from city to city, I think I may have found a way to meet and connect with people uh, no matter where I find myself. Uh, well, at least assuming that uh, the place I find myself uh, has an open mic around. So now let's roll over into my next observation, uh, which is that I noticed a number of times gratitude came up in our discussion. It's always good for me to consider the subject of gratitude. Like even if I don't necessarily get there, it's productive to think about because it brings me closer to a place of gratitude than not thinking about it, if that makes sense. And gratitude is one of those things that you really can't force or manufacture. I think it's just something that you have to try and create space for. It's like setting up a table and hoping that gratitude will come and join you for dinner. 
And I think it's uh, been helpful for me to see different examples of what gratitude can look like and different ways that gratitude can manifest itself in others. Because I think I, I've tended to think of gratitude as being synonymous with being happy or that uh, being grateful will make me happy. And, you know, I thought, uh, okay, so all I've got to do is be grateful. And if I can do that, then I'll be happy. But I don't think it's really that simplistic. But I think that, you know, I do think like this, and it, you know, it sounds, uh, you know, silly to say it out loud. Um, you know, but I think I can be ungrateful and then feel bad that I'm not grateful. Like most things, I believe gratitude is on a spectrum. And I think for me, just recognizing where I am on the spectrum and having some level of acceptance with wherever I may find myself uh, can be helpful. And accepting where I am doesn't mean that I'm content in the sense that I don't want anything more. It just means that I'm not going to try and feel shameful or beat myself up over it. I believe that Y touches on this when he says, I've just been letting my mind be grateful for what I have, what I've done, and just being open, open to all the bad and all the good that can come, not dwelling too much on the bad stuff. I dwell on the bad stuff, but it doesn't command my life, end quote. I believe that's sort of the gem there is but it doesn't command my life. And I feel like that can be the greatest challenge and obstacle, but also the most practical thing perhaps that you can strive for. We don't have much, if any, say in the bad things that happen to us. Some of those things are really bad and you can't simply not dwell on them or think of them. But what we can do is have some control over how we respond to those bad things. And the question, at least for myself, can be, is my response to those bad things making life easier or harder? Or rather, is my response setting me up for other negative things? And, you know, that's not an easy one to answer. And maybe you're not going to, you know, answer that one right. But I think it's worth asking. And I think there are some responses that are clearly not beneficial, while others are more subtle. But maybe by at least thinking about it, then you can hope to, you know, spot some of the blind spots and maybe negative patterns uh, that you may find yourself falling into. At least for myself and my experience with anxiety and depression, the cycle that I can fall into is feeling unmotivated and tired, so then I don't pursue doing things that I enjoy, and then I feel unmotivated and tired because I'm not doing anything that feels fulfilling and worthwhile. And again, you often can't make the bad stuff go away, but there is no need to, you know, then make life even harder for yourself unnecessarily. But I don't believe it should be, you know, a point of shame either if you found yourself doing something that appears counterproductive. And if you've heard me say anything, I hope you hear me say that. Shame is counterproductive. That might be an ongoing theme of this podcast, if not at least the language that I tried to use as often as possible. I was talking about shame with my therapist, the negative effects that it can have on people. I can't remember the words that he used exactly, but I would say in a nutshell, he stated that in all his time as a clinician, he never found shame to be helpful or lead to any positive outcome. It's only been detrimental. Guilt is good and necessary to be experienced, but not shame. There is a difference, and I feel that that gets missed, especially when people want to be right and they want to push their agenda forward. It's often the end justifies the means. Now, that's a topic for another discussion. But if I had to describe the difference between guilt and shame, I might say that in a way, for the sake of comparison, guilt is more external and shame is internal. And what I mean by that is you can experience guilt recognizing that you've done wrong with a mindset that you can change that these things you feel guilty for are not a part of you and who you are. However, shame cuts right down to your innermost being and says that the things that you feel guilty for are a part of you. It's who you are. I'm fundamentally broken. I'm helpless. I can never change. And it takes a hold of you. And from a point of shame, it's very challenging, if not impossible, to make any kind of meaningful progress because in order to make progress, you have to give yourself grace for where you've gone wrong and believe that you have the capacity to change because where you've gone wrong is not who you are. So much of the interpersonal work that I've been doing is learning to forgive myself for the things that I've done, but also forgiving others for the things that they've done to me. And I feel like so much of that work has been stunted in the past because I've spent so much time blaming myself and beating myself up. For others, I'll make lots of excuses. I'll try to justify their actions or simply forget what they've done. But I've been realizing that you can't forgive the offenses that go unclaimed. You have to recognize when and where someone has wronged you. In order for there to be forgiveness, there first has to be something to be forgiven for. But this is contrary to the cliche and all too common saying, forgive and forget. 
No, I'll say it again. I cannot forgive what I don't remember. So there seems to be this back and forth where I forgive myself, and then I'm better able to give true forgiveness to others. I begin holding people accountable and not just, you know, looking like a pushover. Less and less do I think and use the words, it's not their fault. They didn't mean it. Now, I'll still say that because, let's be honest, it's easier than having to deal with the fact that someone hurt you. But regardless of someone's intent, you know, if they hurt you, well, they hurt you. It doesn't matter what their motivation was. More often than not, the ways that people hurt us are done with good intentions. I believe that's why, you know, it can get so confusing and the lines get blurred. And again, it's much easier to either, as one author put it, seek silence or violence, end quote. We either try to bury the unresolved feelings or we look to some kind of vengeance. And although burying things may seem gracious, it isn't. So I believe you can say that the bad stuff doesn't come in your life. That smells like success to me. If you can overcome the bad stuff enough to take those baby steps and recognize that each of those steps, however small as progress, well, that's success. Maybe put another way, I started following Mental Health America on Instagram, and they shared these thoughts that I really appreciated. It speaks to mental illness, but I feel that it applies to mental illness and physical illness as well. They said this, some people get to a point where they feel grateful for what they've learned by living with and recovering from mental illness. It's okay if you never get to that point. It's okay just to accept it and do what you need to to take care of yourself, end quote. So now I want to take a moment to share a brief health slash treatment update. You may have seen me share this on my social media, but in case you missed it, my doctor believes that I have piriformis syndrome. If you look online, it tells you that piriformis syndrome is a disorder in which the piriformis muscle in the buttocks irritates the sciatic nerve. Symptoms include pain, tingling, and numbness in the buttocks and down the leg, which may worsen after sitting for a long time, climbing stairs, walking, or running. Um, so yeah, I mean, at least to agree that that's pretty in line with what I experience. but anyway, that's what my doctor thinks it is. So my current treatment plan is Botox injections. So last Tuesday, I got my first treatment. They put a small dose of Botox into the narrow muscle located in my left butt cheek and yeah, it hurt. And since then I've been experiencing a worsening of some of my symptoms. So the, yeah, that really sucks. And I've just been more or less waiting it out and hoping that I'll get you know, feeling better, or at least stop feeling more discomfort than normal. Partly why I wanted to share this is, you know, to sort of frame this conversation of gratitude. You can understand when dealing with things of this nature, finding gratitude can be really hard. Sometimes I can see the ways that my experience with mental and physical illness has shaped me into the person I am. It's slowed me down. It's given me a sense of empathy and eyes to see the struggles of others. But I'm also like mental and physical illness is the devil. It's evil and I hate it. It takes and robs so much from me. As I talked about in my 17th episode, uh, my conversation with Stephanie Mala, everyone has something. I believe we can all relate to having parts of our lives where we feel like something is missing or incomplete, you know, whether it's within ourselves or in the world. And if it wasn't clear before, I think it's abundantly clear now that the world we live in is broken and has not been made whole. So there are things that are missing. You can pretend that it's not there or try to rationalize it away, trying to spin all those negatives into a positive, although I'm not sure that either of those things are ultimately helpful in the long run. I've never found myself very capable of doing either of those things. Well, I take that back. In my own way, I guess I have done a great deal of trying to pretend that my problems don't exist. What I mean is I've done a great deal of dwelling on my problems, but when I'm not doing that, I'm shoving them down and bottling them up, and neither of those options have been good for me. Having said all this, I find that the path of progress for me is to try and love what's present while accepting what's missing. So in spite of the struggles I face upon reflection, here are some of the things that I've noticed that are present that I love. So first and foremost, for all the aforementioned things I've shared, I'm very grateful for the peanut butter and jams open mics uh, hosted every Wednesday night. And second, I'm grateful to have a full-time job. So I'm not trying to rationalize my position at my job overemphasizing the positives and making it sound like it's a great situation because it's not. There's been numerous times that I've felt that staying at my current job is not good for me. And I tell people this, that I'll be at my job until I find something better or when I get completely fed up with it, whichever comes first. I don't want to work there any longer than I have to, but I'm there now. So with all that being said, I've worked at worse places and I'm glad to be out of the food and service industry 
And at one point I was working like three different jobs. It was kind of insane and I hated it. And overall I was doing fine on Medicaid for health insurance, but it seemed like I hit a bit of a roadblock when I began seeking mental health services, unfortunately. Having one full-time job and working like 8.30 to 5 with weekends off has been really nice. And my job has been low enough responsibility that I feel like I can pretty much, you know, pretty easily check in and out mentally. And I was provided with a decent health insurance uh, plan enough to, you know, I believe it helped me anyways when I was seeking the care of a licensed therapist. Now, the third thing I don't think can be understated. As I mentioned, I've been seeing a licensed therapist and I've been doing that on a weekly basis. And I'm very grateful for that. I so wish that I'd seen someone so long ago and maybe that I'd been more encouraged to see someone. But better late than never definitely applies here. I'm aware that I'm very privileged to be receiving counseling, and it's not something that's readily available to everyone. And just from my own personal experience, it took me several months to get my foot in the door. And that's an unfortunate reality that, you know, it's maybe something to discuss in another conversation. But to anyone who does have an opportunity to see someone, I can't recommend it enough. I think I learned the hard way that there's no fast track or express lane to healing. However, after many years of feeling stagnant and like my life wasn't going anywhere, like I had all these weights holding me back from moving forward. I found it invaluable to have someone completely detached from my friends and family who I can open up to and share everything with. And I've been able to slowly unpack some of the things in my life that I've got unresolved. I think just as I made an episode specifically focused on my physical health journey, I think an episode talking about my mental health journey may be in order. But until then, I'll just let this be a preface for that. Now, the fourth thing I'm grateful for is that I discovered Yorktown, Virginia, and I can't remember what I may or may not have shared with you about Yorktown, how I discovered it. So you'll have to forgive me if I'm repeating myself and I'll try to keep the story short, but there's a long road near my house called the Colonial Parkway, and there are a number of beaches off of this parkway. And during the year 2020, during quarantine, there were still people flocking to those beaches and you would get all these people gathered together. And there was this very real concern uh, about the spread of the virus and authorities were still trying to understand how the virus operates and by what means it spreads and how easily it could be transmitted from person to person. So as an act of prevention, the authorities blocked off sections of the parkway to motor vehicles, preventing access to the beaches, and they hoped it eliminate crowding at those beaches, which I believe it did for the most part. But an unintended consequence of blocking off the road to motor vehicles created a unique opportunity for folks to walk and bike along this road without the risk of fast driving cars. And so this road became a very active spot for cyclists and walkers alike. And I, for one, was having the time of my life. At this point, things were also slowing down at my work and they would let me out early. And so almost every day after work, I was out there on that parkway getting fresh air and taking in all the brilliant sights and even the smells uh, from some of the flowers that are on the parkway. And I feel like the parkway had about everything in terms of topography. I guess that's the word you would use. You know, I had woods and fields with farmland and, you know, river beaches as well. And I've discovered that I love exploring and having the feeling that I've gotten away from my home. And, you know, it's been really challenging with the health issues I've been dealing with. It's made it a particular challenge to travel and be far away from home. So having access to something like the parkway so close has been perfect for me. Fortunately, the situation of the pandemic improved, but as a result, they eventually reopened the parkway. And at that point, I was without a place to get away. I was in need of a new spot, and I had been praying about it. It took a few months, but eventually, I found my new place in Yorktown. I wrote this on social media. This setting sun marks the second to last day of my then vacation and the final day of my walks on the Colonial Parkway. It was a sad night, but on the next day, there was a new blessing in store for me. It was the last day of my vacation. I didn't know what I wanted to do, where I wanted to go. I just knew I needed to get out of town. With the Colonial Parkway once again opened to drivers. I, on a whim, decided to drive the parkway all the way down to its end and discovered my new weekend getaway, Yorktown. Yorktown has truly been an amazing find. Being only about 22 to 30 minutes away, I can find myself on the boardwalks of a beach and open fields or at a creek hidden away within the woods. And as I said, I've been realizing that I have a love of adventure and exploring new spaces. I need opportunities to get away and feel like I can escape from the normality of home. But with my health challenges, I found it a challenge to scratch that itch and experience, uh, you know, it's life-giving benefits for me. So finding something so close by that also feels foreign and unfamiliar has been a godsend. So the fifth and final thing that I'll mention 
is that I've had the space and time to rediscover myself by beginning to go through a process of deconstruction. Therapist and host of the Typography podcast, Ian Morgan Cron, talks about deconstruction like this. Moving into a space where Carl Jung would call individuation, which is separating yourself from the values of your upbringing, and you can return to them if you choose, if they really belong to you, if they really are for you. But in many instances, we have to leave home. Home is a place you leave. You have to find your own voice and space in the world. I was handed some beliefs. Maybe some were good. Maybe some weren't. Which things am I going to keep? Which things am I going to throw out? What's the new life going to look like? You know, because otherwise, if people don't go through that journey, they'll go through life with a story that might not be their own, end quote. One guest on the podcast, author, wife, and mother, Ali Kazaza, replied with these words. And isn't that the most terrifying thing? That's where I felt like I was, to try to be good and to try to perform and make sure everyone was happy and approving of me, because that's what I was told. It was like life or death. If I'm not getting approval, I might get rejected. I might die. That's how it felt. Allie goes on to say that when you start to unravel yourself and you're not supported, you can lose everything that you built so far by changing the core of what you believe, of what you know, and who we are, and it's scary. But do it though, because the worst thing, self-betrayal and self-suppression, is cancer in your bones. You cannot live. You're not really living. She then shared how she felt that she literally made herself sick by suppressing herself. She described having a fire within herself that wanted to come out, but that she wasn't allowing. But it would come out in other ways, she said. It was aggression and anger and resentment and hurting people close to me. That fire has to come out somewhere. It doesn't just go away. And I believe if you suppress yourself too much, you make yourself sick. And it will leak out into really unhealthy and toxic ways. So you've got to figure it out. You've got to figure out who you are and accept yourself. Ian Cron then goes on to share this concept as he puts it. Reclaiming the person you were before the world told you who you were supposed to be. And I relate to so much of that. I really do feel that living someone else's story as a recipe for poor health. And back as early as 2019, I began to hit a wall. And I was like, I can't do this anymore. Whatever I'm doing is not sustainable and it's not working for me. And so I've been asking myself questions like, what's the story I've been told? What's this story I've been telling myself? And is it true? And now I've been seeing this new and exciting opportunity to rewrite and retell my story. And it has also been scary. Uh, you know, it's been it's been some bumps along the way. And, you know, right now I don't really know where I'm headed and and that uncertainty, you know, you know, feels really uncomfortable. But honestly, I feel like I've been adrift for, you know, some time and going through the motions, unsure of why I'm doing what I'm doing and having no idea where it's leading me. And I, you know, so I haven't cleaned house or thrown everything out, metaphorically speaking, but I believe I've at least become a bit more, you know, critical minded. Uh, what I mean by this is I'm no longer just accepting everything that, you know, as it comes to me, I'm pushing it back a bit more. I'm learning how to advocate for myself better, and I'm learning how to create boundaries for myself. And I'm no longer, you know, giving everyone space in my life and in my head. And, you know, there are some whose opinions I don't need to concern myself with. There are some people that I, you know, can let go of. And, you know, it's not a petty thing. Some people just make it really easy, you know, with some, all you have to do is just walk away from the group they're a part of and don't reach out to them. And, if they never reach out to you, it's like, okay, I guess that's how it is now. I believe that I mentioned this in a previous episode, but I'll mention again that overall, I feel like I've been more proactive about unfollowing people that I either never see in real life anymore or that I have like no interactions with because at that point, it's like, why do I need to concern myself with what they're doing? A person only has so much bandwidth and I'd much rather focus my attentions on people and things that are within my sphere of influence. At this point, I feel it would be appropriate to throw this in here. And this is something that I saw someone share online that really got me thinking. And this was from uh, Jay Eleni, I believe is how you would say her name. Um, and the post reads, I want people to stop acting like learning or worth is super freeing and happy moment. Those first few moments of realization is actually the hardest. Now you got to cut people off, change habits, find a new environment. That purge when you learn your worth is not fun. So first off, I'd like to say that those thoughts or anyone else who has thought similarly is valid. And the path to personal growth and better health is very individualized. It's going to look differently from person to person. 
people come from different backgrounds and experiences, ethnicities, socioeconomic levels, even find themselves with different levels of support. Some people, depending on their situation, may not need to make as many changes to their environment or cut people off, but others may risk, as Ali Kazaza put it, losing everything they had built so far up to that point. And that's a really harsh reality. So it definitely wouldn't be fair to say that this process, and it is a process, not a moment, is super freeing and happy for everyone. Though I do wish that it would be at least as sweet as it is bitter, and have its joy as well as its sorrow. And after however many years of suffering, I wish that there would finally be signs of hope that things could get better. I believe that's the biggest celebration for many people. They felt like they've been in the dark for so long. Seeing the clouds overhead lift even a little can feel like a game changer, a miracle even. And in their mind, the benefits far outweigh the negatives. But whatever way you slice it, the process will always demand some changes are made, and change is really ever easy. Change is very hard and not only requires learning new things, but requires unlearning years old and ingrained habits, thoughts, and behaviors. So yes, the process can be very, very hard, and I hope no one is misinformed and gets completely blindsided by that. But all that being said, even though it's hard, I would say that doesn't mean that it's not worth doing. And the good news is that because it's a process and not a moment, you don't have to do it all at once. It's those small baby steps, choosing to tackle one thing at a time. I hope that we would all choose to be a baby and start taking those small steps or continue making those small steps, if that's the case for you. There's always more to be realized and new parts of ourselves to discover. Now looking more on the horizon, I've been deciding that my current career field, graphic design, has become a dead end for me. It's just something that I fell into. It's never what I set out to do, and I'm really not all that passionate about it. So I've been considering what it might look like to go back to school and maybe become a licensed therapist myself, maybe becoming a mental health counselor or working at a school as a career counselor. I'm still very much in the brainstorming phase, but I'm glad to be thinking about the future from the perspective of where do I want to go and what do I want to be doing now that I have a better understanding of myself and I've begun to strip away and peel back some of the fear and anxiety that I've identified with for so long and that dictated so many of my decisions in the past. I don't want to be shut away in a cubicle or kept behind a closed door. I want to be interacting with people and improving people's lives through my care and attention. So I hope that you've been able to see yourself and what I've shared and that it's been of some encouragement to you. I hope that I was able to strike a balance between keeping it real and being uplifting as well. I believe you can handle some of the heavier aspects of my life because, well, we all have to face and deal with heavy things. But by sharing, we can see that we're not alone. And although our individual struggles may look very different, we can walk through them together and see ourselves both better off for it. Thank you for tuning in to Mike the Mike. If you have any comments or have a suggested topic for a future episode, or if you would like to inquire about joining me on the podcast, you can email me at beckm.podcast at gmail.com, or you can direct message me on Instagram at mikethemike.fm. You can find all those addresses mentioned, as well as any related links and citations for this episode listed in the episode's description. Until next time, stay well and take care.